The raid on Trump's resort shouldn't be too much of a surprise, as was pointed out by the once anonymous editorial in the New York Times from a self-proclaimed member of the deep state or steady state, there is a quiet resistance within the administration, which was the Trump administration. And let's not forget Hillary Clinton's and Joe Biden's encouragement to like-minded opposition within the DC Beltway bureaucracy when Trump was first elected. Biden said, please stay, please stay. There has to be some competence and normalcy. Hillary said, stick it out, stick it out, because the tide has to turn. Looking at the America the Biden administration has created, the tide certainly did turn, and this is their normalcy. The quiet resistance has become a full-blown scream of hysteria. We'll focus on this and offer solutions in this episode, including what you can do right now. Please be sure to take the recommended actions in the video description, and of course, to like, subscribe, and share this information with others on your social media platforms. The actions of the FBI are just another in a long line of reasons as to why a national police force would be harmful in a free society. The raid shows us what happens when the federal government turns its ire inward on political opposition. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a communist tactic of smoking out your opposition in order to identify and target its leaders. For example, the good people of Cuba have been under a communist dictatorship since the late 1950s. It used to be one of the most successful Latin American countries until the communist revolution. Now, as NBC News recently reported, meanwhile, for most Cubans on the island, life continues to be difficult. They have become accustomed to checking a daily news segment with an update on the power blackouts throughout the island. Ration cards for items like rice, beans, sugar, chicken, and milk for kids up to seven years old supply Cubans with enough food for about a week. The rest has to be purchased in state-owned stores, but inflation has made many products unattainable. Last year, many Cubans had had enough, and in July, took to the streets in widespread demonstrations. News reports claim it was spontaneous, but to get thousands of people into the streets all at one time is never spontaneous. It must be organized. Just who or what did so remains to be revealed, but the result was to arrest demonstrators during the protest, and then afterwards, police and soldiers went door to door searching for participants. Again, news reports indicate about 1,000 people jailed, with a possible majority of them sentenced up to 25 years in prison. Historically, communist regimes would try to smoke out the opposition by such methods as rallying them into street protests or related activities. Communists would infiltrate the groups, exercise leadership, and draw out additional leaders and supporters, many of whom were killed. So let's draw a parallel to our own federal government, which has a history of implementing coups in foreign countries through the CIA. The FBI fares no better with its commonly known tactic of entrapment by infiltrating groups. Just look at the recent example of the militia in Michigan who supposedly had plans to kidnap and execute their governor. And also, back in 2010, the FBI had targeted a Michigan militia to convince them to kill a police officer and then use explosives to bomb his funeral. In both instances, the FBI had multiple informants, provided leadership for the groups, and pumped cash and resources to get their targets to act. Is a raid on Trump's resort a similar event to smoke out the opposition? Well, let's ask the same question of the January 6th protest. As Revolver.com has extensively documented, the FBI may have had a similar plan of entrapment with some at the January 6th protest. As has been pointed out, the federal intelligence and military apparatus must always have threats to work on. Their funding depends on it. Where few exist, it is generated, perhaps to keep political opponents in check. Remember the adage, what government subsidize, it gets more of. The latest and most dangerous threat to our country was defined by President Biden and echoed by U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland in June 2021 as terrorism from white supremacy. The Biden administration formed a national st strategy for countering domestic terrorism, which published a guiding document of the same name. It points to the FBI as a strategic partner and has the goals of strengthening ties with local police, passing gun control, additional internet censorship, and spying on veterans through their doctor. About $100 million has already been allocated for it. Strengthening ties with local police is very concerning. 
After the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the national network of fusion centers were created throughout the country that provides a bridge between federal intelligence and local and state law enforcement with the intent of gathering, analyzing, and sharing threat-related information. But you know, we have to ask the question. If they are so focused on security, then why in the world are our borders wide open, with states having to fend for themselves? Perhaps that tells you of their real focus. The real focus is largely on everyday Americans. In 2012, a report from the U.S. Senate had this to say about the fusion centers. The 72 state and local fusion centers that form a centerpiece of the Homeland Security Department's domestic anti-terrorism strategy produce intelligence of uneven quality, oftentimes shoddy, rarely timely, and sometimes endangering citizens' civil liberties and Privacy Act protections. In February 2009, a fusion center in Missouri came out swinging against patriots with the infamous MIAC strategy report titled the Modern Militia Movement. The report pointed to those who believed in conspiracy theories and used such terms as New World Order, North American Union, Constitutional Convention, and were concerned about Second Amendment rights being chipped with RFID technologies, and were supporters of, president, or of presidential candidates Ron Paul, Chuck Baldwin, and Bob Barr. Additional warning signs included displaying the Gadsden flag and the term Molon Leib. A few months later, DHS came out with its own infamous report on right-wing extremism. It pointed to a segment of returning veterans of the Afghan and Iraq wars as being primed for radicalization and likewise included New World Order, illegal immigration, and gun control as trigger topics. This is your federal government where everybody concerned about the direction of this country is a suspected domestic terrorist. Except for, of course, those that were actually responsible for the property damage and killings during the riots of 2020. In fact, during his confirmation hearing, Merrick Garland said he doesn't consider the Antifa and BLM riots as domestic terrorism because they happened after hours when facilities were closed. However, he was so concerned about parents who were vocal about their kids' education at school board meetings that he ordered the FBI to mobilize against those parents last October. One activist parent in Colorado actually had her home raided by the FBI. A few weeks ago, U.S. Representative Jim Jordan revealed that whistleblowers told him and other GOP members of the House Judiciary Committee that FBI agents are manufacturing fake domestic terror data to push the idea that white supremacists and even parents who attended school board meetings are major security threats. Whistleblowers also said, FBI officials are pressuring agents to reclassify cases as domestic violent extremism, even if the cases do not meet the criteria for such a classification. And this week, Representative Jordan has said that the number of FBI whistleblowers who have courageously stepped forward to help with Republican investigations is now 14. Also, a couple of weeks ago, leaked documents from Project Veritas exposed the FBI's flyer on symbols to watch out for that may identify militia violent extremism, or MVEs. These symbols include the Gadsden flag, images from the Revolutionary War, the Betsy Ross flag, and the Liberty Tree, among others. Folks, the federal government has been weaponized against Americans for decades. It now does so with the full support of President Biden and its crackdown on the imaginary white supremacist hiding under every rock. Robert Welch, founder of the John Birch Society, knew of the dangers of a national police force. He knew that a police state was a hallmark for totalitarianism and that a police state could easily be created with a national police that would enforce the interests of the state and not the people. The American system of local police guards against the widespread trampling of rights from central government and offers local accountability and protection to the residents of the community. Seeing a coming attack on local police, Mr. Welch created the Support Your Local Police and Keep Them Independent project in mid-1963 for JBS members and other supporters to work on. Still around today, the project has been very successful over the decades in exposing and stopping leftist civilian review boards, killed the Federal Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, 
and help to educate many Americans as to the importance that local police pay in keeping America free and the obligation police have in protecting the local communities they serve from unconstitutional oversteppings of the federal government. In fact, the SYLP program is so powerful that it caught the attention of a fusion center. Back in 2012, staff at the headquarters of the John Birch Society sent out an information packet about the Support Your Local Police project to all chiefs of police, sheriffs, and state patrol headquarters in the U.S. Now, the mailing was just to over about 16,000 officers. The goal was to help reintroduce the project while JBS members were asked to follow up. Well, not long thereafter, we received a phone call from the West Virginia Intelligence Fusion Center asking us about the packet. They had received a concerned call from an officer who didn't understand it and thought that it might be a threat. It was obvious that that officer could certainly have used some basic educational principles on the role of local police in a free society. Instead of contacting us, the officer forwarded it to whom he or she thought was some sort of federal superior or law enforcement partner, both of which are dangerous concepts and will eventually lead to a police state if fully implemented. In 2016, we were contacted by a local FBI agent who wanted to learn more about JBS. Well, we set up a meeting and two agents showed up. A number of us on the executive staff were involved in the meeting. They asked questions about the mission of the organization and wanted to know our protocol for handling anyone suspicious, since our staff and members come into contact with plenty of people. Our response was that, well, we don't attract that kind of person, and our vetting process for membership helps to lower the possibility of any infiltrators. Plus, we said that if we did come into a situation that would warrant law enforcement, we would first be talking to the local police or the sheriff, depending on the situation. Former CEO Art Thompson tells the story of another meeting with the FBI. Back in the 1960s in Washington State, a gentleman joined a local member chapter whom no one seemed to know too well. He initially sounded like a great prospect, but shortly thereafter, within a month or two, he began to discuss committing bank robberies and related violence, none of which is part of the JBS agenda, and he was kicked out. Mr. Thompson was reading the newspaper about a year later and saw this same guy's photo listing him as an FBI informant that had helped to thwart a bank robbery. Can you say entrapment? We have had some members in the 1960s that were FBI informants, including the Reverend Delmar Dennis, who helped to bring down the KKK. Before becoming a JBS member, Julia Brown was asked by the FBI to infiltrate the Communist Party, and for nine years she did. We later published her testimony called I Testify in 1966. She was integral in exposing and stopping the violence that would accompany the speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As she exposed the communist tactic of agitation, we too must recognize the tactics being used against Americans. Earlier this week, the FBI warned about increasing threats and internet chatter against federal law enforcement since the raid on Trump's home. If they are following the tactic, they are creating the situation of smoking out those that would or could do something stupid, which is then used as political ammunition to further a political agenda in Congress, as well as through related federal agencies, including an attack on the First and Second Amendments. Our advice is don't take the bait. Now, does that mean we should do nothing? Absolutely not. But put your efforts into something constructive. Those that do use violence or unethical means usually do so because they inaccurately do not see any other choice. The John Birch Society was created to be the constructive outlet of turning America around. We recognize the organization and the agenda behind the war on America. We have a counter agenda that exposes and directly hits back to those involved in this war, including supporting local police and keeping them independent of federal control. The Founding Fathers recognized early on that it was going to be difficult for Americans to keep their republic, and they pointed to an informed electorate that would be the best way to keep the republic. One that knew the Constitution, how to adhere to its limitations, and how to be part of its checks and balances. Government is a direct reflection of its electorate. If it's not operating within its constitutional limitations, allowing freedom to prosper, 
then we the people are not doing our jobs. Let's get organized and put government back into its proper role. We can do so with your help. We're active in all 50 states, so find out today what opportunities are in your area. Contact one of our coordinators using our lookup tool at jbs.org. Just type in your zip code to get the contact information. Links are in the description. And please, be sure to like, subscribe, and share this information through your social media platforms. I'm Bill Hahn for the John Birch Society. Until next time, stay informed, stay active, and get organized, patriots.